Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'm really pleased to uh, uh, present Andrew Ng. Uh, he's known to many of us because he's collaborated with us over the years. Um, he was a, a, a PhD student at the University of California at Berkeley, and then since 2002, he's been at Stanford as a professor, working on lots of hard AI problems across multiple fields. So uh, here's Andrew. Cool. Thanks, John. So I should just loud enough, people can hear me. What I wanted to do today was tell you a bit about some work we've been doing on STAIR, or the Stanford AI Robot Project. So STAIR project was started about three years ago, in, motivated by the observation that today the field of AI has fragmented into many different subfields, and today each of those boxes is an almost entirely separate research area of almost entirely separate conferences and so on. And want to define, excuse me, want to define unifying challenge problems that require tying together these disparate threads of AI and pursue the integrated AI dream again. And, for those of you familiar with the history of AI, I think of this as a project very much in the tradition of shaky and flaky, but doing this with you know, 2008 AI technology rather than 1966 AI technology, as was in the case of flaky, uh, shaky. So these are long-term challenge problems we set for ourselves. To build a single robot can do things like tidy a room, use a dishwasher, fetch and deliver items around the office, assemble furniture, prepare meals. There's the thought that if you can build a robot that can do all of these things, then maybe that's when it becomes useful to put a robot in every home. Um, in the short term, what we want to do was have the robot fetch an item from an office. In other words, to have a robot understand a verbal command, like stare, please fetch the stapler from my office, and have it be able to understand the command and carry out the task. And so what I'm going to do is tell you today about the elements we tied together to um, build that stair piece fetch the stapler from my office application. And the elements repeated on this slide are object recognition, so you can say recognize the stapler. Um, mobile manipulations, so you can navigate indoor spaces and open doors. Depth perception, um, take us into a discussion of estimating distances from a single still image. Talk about grasping and manipulation to let the robot pick up objects, and lastly, spoken dialogue system to tie the whole system together. So let's start by talking about object recognition. So I think human vision, or robotic vision today, is far inferior to um, human vision. And there are many reasons that human vision um, is, so much, is, is, is so much superior to current robotic vision systems. And people in literature will talk about use of context, talk about common sense, there are many reasons like that. One reason that I think has not been exploited in the literature is just the reason that humans use a fovea to look directly at objects and therefore obtain high resolution images of it. And recognizing objects is just much easier from high resolution images than from low resolution ones. So for example, if I show you that image and ask you what is this, I don't know, how many of you can tell? Actually, what? Yes. Which is? Well, copy. Well, wow, cool, right, yeah. you guys are good. It's actually easier from the back of the room. Um, <laughs> and once I show you a high resolution image, it's so much easier to tell what that is. It turns out the picture on the left is what a coffee mug looks like at five meters distance from a robot. And so maybe it's no wonder that you know, object recognition is so hard to get to work well. Um, so just to be clear, right, if, if, I don't know, if I'm standing here, if I'm facing you like this, I actually do not have enough pixels in my eyes to recognize that this is a laptop. For me to recognize this is a laptop, I need to turn my eyes and look directly at it and get a high resolution image of it. I can now recognize that this is a laptop, and I can then look away and continue to track this black blob in my peripheral vision, and I know it's still a laptop. So, it turns out that using off-the-shelf hardware, it's fairly straightforward to replicate this sort of foveal peripheral vision system. In particular, you can use a pan-to-zoom camera. This is a camera that can turn and pan and zoom into different parts of the scene to simulate the steerable foveal. Um, and you can use a fixed wide-angle camera down here to simulate your wide field of view, low-resolution peripheral, uh, peripheral vision system. And let's just point out that, you know, unlike 
object recognition on, on you know, internet images. So if, if, if you're a computer vision researcher and if all you do is you download, inter, download images off the internet, then you know, it's, it's, it's as if you, you're actually not allowed to work on this problem, right? Because you cannot zoom into images you downloaded off the internet. Um, because most video is, there, inter images is an important and interesting problem in its own right, but I think when you work with vision in physical spaces, then um, alternatives like these become very natural. Just a little bit more detail, we can learn a foveal control strategy or learn where to look next in order to try to uh, minimize uncertainty or maximize information gain and minimize entropy, where we express the entropy in terms of the uncertainty about the objects we're tracking and uh, objects that we may not yet have found in the scene. And um, when you maximize this, what it boils down into is a foveal control strategy that trades off automatically the twin goals of trying to look around to search in the objects versus occasionally uh, confirming the location of previously found objects. This, by the way, was the only, is, the, is, is the only equation I have in this talk. So, you know, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> just, to show, just to show you how it works, in this video, in the upper right-hand corner is the wide-angle peripheral vision uh, view, and in the lower left corner is the high-resolution foveal view. On the upper left is what we call the interest belief state. Um, oh, my laser pointer running out of battery, no. It's the interest belief state, which is a learned estimate of how interesting it is to look at different parts of the scene, or how likely you are to find a new object if you, found, if, if you look there. And as the robot pans its camera around to zoom into different parts of the scene, you can sort of tell that you know, it's infinitely easier to recognize the objects from the high resolution foveal view on the lower left than it is to recognize objects from those vague blurs on the upper right. And if you evaluate the algorithm more quantitatively, you know, depending on the experimental setup, we get, say, 71% performance improvement. And just to be clear, if any of you are ever interested in building you know, some camera system or some vision system for some physical space, like, I don't know, if you want to put a camera system in a retirement home to monitor the retirees to ensure their safety or whatever, um, I actually think of slapping a fovea on it as low-hanging fruit for suddenly allowing yourself to see the entire world in high resolution and giving your vision system a significant performance boost. The next two elements we'll talk about um, just in two slides is mobile manipulation, having robots navigate an open door. So let's talk about that. So we actually worked out two versions of the system. In the first one, it turns out that most office buildings have um, identical doors. And um, in, I guess, very briefly, what we did was actually develop a representation for office spaces and doors that allows a robot to reason simultaneously about very coarse maps, like a 10 centimeter grid map to enable a robot to navigate huge building size spaces, as well as in the same sort of probabilistically coherent model, reason about one millimeter model, uh, models of a door that are accurate about a millimeter, since you need about you know, three to five millimeter accuracy in order to manipulate the door handle. So you can have a model that's probabilistically coherent despite the two very different resolutions of, of, of these two spaces. Um, and then more recent version is putting this together with the foveal vision system that I just described. So you can have a robot that uses vision to recognize novel door handles, um, and in some cases elevator buttons as well, so that you can put the robot and have it see a novel door that's never seen before, and see and recognize the door handle and figure out how to manipulate a door handle, um, also using a motion planner to plan sort of the motion needed for the arm to manipulate the door handle. So this video shows a number of examples of the robot seeing novel doors, test set doors that's never seen before. Uh, we're going around looking for doors to test this on. This is actually a robot trying to go inside the men's room. Um, elevator button work is more preliminary, but it's the same algorithm, pushing elevator buttons. And the overall performance of the system on opening doors, novel doors, is, was 91%. Have, have people tried this problem before? This so it turns out there's lots of work on opening known doors. Uh, I believe we're the first to have a robot open previously unseen doors. Right. And so that sequence. Different handle types. So there could be twist ones, there could be push ones. Or I see. Were they all the yeah, so, uh, yeah, you're right. So let's see, in the video I showed, this was restricted to um, uh, handles, not knobs, and only push doors. 
Um, I believe this robot is mechanically not capable of pulling a door shut behind it, for example. Um, but with a newer robot, did you see a picture of um, where actually the student Ellen is, is, is applying pretty much the same algorithm to that problem. We haven't done that yet. using the camera or does it also have lasers or some other kind of yeah, let's see. In this, um, boy, we've done many things over time. Uh, we have done this using only uh, cameras and uh, stereo cameras. We've also done this using a single camera and a laser. And we've actually, we've done this with different sets of sensors. The results you saw here, I believe, were with a single camera and a horizontally mounted sick laser scanner. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, but but although but but it works about equally well using only vision. So, <clears throat> next elements I want to tell you about was um, 3D perception. It takes us into a discussion of estimating depths from a single still image. So, let's talk about that. If I show you that picture and ask you how far things were from the camera when this picture was taken. You can look at it and maybe sort of guess, right? Or if I show you that picture and ask you how far objects were from the camera, you can sort of tell that, you know, the tree on the left is probably further than the tree on the right from the camera when this picture was taken. Um, the problem of estimating distances from a single image, from a single still image, has traditionally been considered an impossible problem in computer vision. And in a narrow mathematical sense, it is an impossible problem. But this is a problem that you and I solve fairly well, and we'd like our robot to do the same in order to give a robot a sense of depth perception. So it turns out that there is, of course, lots of prior work on depth estimation from vision. Most of this prior work has focused on approaches like stereo vision, where you use two cameras in triangulation. And um, I think that often works poorly in practice for scenes like these. There are a number of other approaches that use multiple images, and it turns out um, to be all very difficult to get uh, them to work on many of these indoor and outdoor scenes. And um, I should say there was also some contemporary work to ours done by Derek Horm at CMU. But the question is, given a single image like that, how can you estimate distances? So this is the approach that we took. We collected a training set comprising a large um, set of pairs of images of monocular images like these and ground truth depth maps like that on the right. So in the ground truth depth map, the different colors indicate different distances where yellow is close by, red is further away, and blue is very far away. And these ground truth depth maps are collected using a laser scanner, right, where you, know, you send pulses of light out in the environment, measure how long the light takes to go out, hit something, and bounce back to your sensor. And because you know the speed of light, this allows you to directly measure the distance of every pixel. And then having collected a large training set, we then learn a function mapping from monocular images like these to what the ground truth depth maps look like using supervised learning. So a little bit more detail. In order to construct this learning algorithm, uh, to construct features for this learning algorithm, we actually first went to the psychological literature to try to understand what are some of the visual cues used by humans, used by people, to estimate depths. So some of the cues that you and I use turn out to be things like texture variations and texture gradient. So for example, those two patches is, is all the same stuff. It's all the rows of draws, but the texture of these two patches are very different because they're very different distances. Other cues that people use include haze or color. So things that are far away tend to be uh, uh, hazy and tinge slightly blue because of um, atmospheric light scattering. We also use cues like, sh um, like shading, defocus, occlusion, and known object size. Um, so for example, if those two rectangles look like they're similar in size to you, that's only because your visual system is so good for correcting for distance. Um, in fact, they're about 15% different in size, and so if you know people are roughly five to six feet tall, then by seeing how tall they appear in an image, you can know roughly how far away that is. So we constructed feature vectors that try to capture as many of these cues as we could, and realistically, I think we do a decent job capturing the first few of this list and less good job capturing you know, the, second, the second half of this list, maybe. And then... Given an image, we then came up with a probabilistic model of distances. Um, in, and in, in detail, given an image, we compute 
image features everywhere in the image, and then we constructed a probabilistic model known as a Markov random view model. Uh, but informally, what that does is allows us to model the relation between the depth and features. In other words, it models how specific image features may directly help allow you to estimate the depth at a point. Um, also models relation between depths at the same spatial scale because um, two pixels, two adjacent pixels are more likely to be at similar distances than at very different distances, as well as relation between depths at multiple spatial scales. When you train this algorithm using um, you know, supervised learning, these are examples of test set results. So in the leftmost column is a single monocular image. In the middle column is the ground truth depth map collected using the laser scanner. And in the rightmost column is the estimated depth map uh, given only that one image as input. So the algorithm actually makes interesting errors. I'll point one out here, which is th that tree there is actually in the foreground, right? That tree is actually fairly close to the camera, but the algorithm misses it entirely and, and you know, thinks that tree is much further away. Um, the example below so it looks okay. Just a few more examples. And let's just point out another interesting error. Um, again, this image up here, this bush here is in the foreground, and that tree there is in the background. Right? So these are two you know, physically separate objects where this bush in the lower right is significantly closer to the camera than the tree in the background. But the algorithm misses that as well and sort of ends up blending together the depths of the tree and the bush. Right? But other than that, these, these again sort of look okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What's for it was not Gaussian. No, so. Um, it had edges or did it have sort of more, more hairy stuff inside of it? Let's see. So, this turned out to, uh, one of the things we wanted to do was to make inference a convex problem. And so, this was an MRF where um, it's e to the then L1 functions or e to the sum of a lot of absolute value terms. And the absolute value terms essentially you know, capture these sorts of relations. In, in, in more sophisticated models, we actually reason explicitly about coplanarity and, and, and a, bunch of other a bunch of other more complicated phenomena. Um, so there are other cues like that. If you find a long line in an image, um, if you look at an image and you find a long line in the picture, that long line will probably correspond to a long line in 3D as well. So, so the, there are like three or four types of cues like that that, that the MRF that's us capture. And part of the technical challenge is how to encode all of these things so it's still a convex optimization problem. Was there anything on the bottom layer that was like a uh, like machine learning observation model or something? Or is it sort of just very simple models hooking up the, the features to that? Uh, yeah. Um, was boy. Was optimization problem essentially? Or was there any sort of machine learning bits underneath? I see. There was one other machine learning bit, which is. Um, uh, 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 surface edge detection. So one of the steps we do is look at an image and for, for every point in the image, try to decide if um, there's a physical discontinuity there. So for example, I'm standing here, there's a physical discontinuity between the top of my laptop and my chest. And so we try to recognize those points and then those help the MRF do better as well. Um, yeah, it's come parts of it complicated. Um, we actually evaluate the algorithm quantitatively. It's about 30, 35% uh, per pixel error, but, but let's skip over that. So more interesting is, um, you know, right now I've been showing you depth maps. One, one of the other things you can do with this is um, actually take the models you estimate and render them as 3D fly-through models. And so let me go and show you an example of that. In what I'm about to show you, the entirety of the input to the algorithm was one of these three images. And so let's take a look at the sorts of 3D models you get from these um, images. So first of the three examples. The first picture is actually a picture that we took ourselves on the Stanford campus. But given a single image, this is an example of the 3D fly-through model you get. It's in, you know, flying to the scene. I'm actually really bad at driving this thing. Right, turn left, look at the 3D shape of the tree. Ah. Um, it's another fun one. So let's imagine that we're standing together in front of this house. And I'm going to squat down. 
So the wall comes up, you can't see the cars anymore. Stand up, squat down, walk around to the side. The second and third images are actually internet images. They're downloaded off the internet. Um, let's fly down the river. So turn right, look at the trees. Turn left, look at the free shape of the mountain, and so on. So, yeah. Yes, were those built with the generated depth map? Say that again? Were those built using the generated depth map that you showed before? So that was a more sophisticated version of the algorithm than the basic depth map one. The ideas are roughly the same. So um, I, uh, boy, have to go into more detail. I guess one difference was that um, those in, in, in the more sophisticated version that I didn't talk that much about, we actually first over segment the image using a super pixel segmentation algorithm, the Felsenfrauf's code. And then, <coughs> um, so imagine using a pair of scissors to cut this picture up into lots of small pieces, into super pixels, and then using an inference algorithm to take each of these pieces and infer where you should paste them in 3D. And when you do that, then that helps you preserve planar surfaces. And lastly, we then texture map the image back onto this you know, 3D model where we've pasted all these pieces somewhere out in 3D. Oh, same as again? A stereoscopic version of, of, if I had two inputs, it's slightly different mm -hmm. you know, points of view, I might have to do that. Yeah, yeah, actually, yes, you're right. Well, um, there's something that I wasn't going to show, but let me see if I have it. So, um, what was I? I think I might have a hidden slide that does that. But, yeah, so it turns out that, uh, you know, on many images, um, monocular does okay. Stereo, um, this is our stereo vision system. Black is where it did not find correspondences and therefore did not re return depths. And if you combine the monocular cues and the stereo cues, then um, you get better, you get measurably better results than either mono only or stereo only. And where by stereo, I mean triangulation. And you can also do things like take a few images and build large scale models where parts of the images are seen only by one camera and parts of the images are seen by multiple cameras. Cool. So, um, I can't find where I was in the talk. Yeah, okay, cool. And so, um, is October which means some of you may recently have gotten back from various summer holidays or whatever. Um, so this album is actually up on the website. And um, if any of you want to take you know, your own holiday pictures and upload it to the website, then if the album works. So turn your pictures into 3D models so that you can revisit your holiday memories in 3D rather than the flat pictures. So that was depth perception. and. Um, it turns out one of the most interesting applications of these ideas is the robotic grasping or the manipulation. Because right? um, you know, with depth perception, that gives a robot a sense of the space around it. But on the other hand, with a robot, you can use lasers or whatever to directly measure depth. But um, we're actually going to apply some of these ideas to robotic manipulation. So let's talk about that. So robotics today is in is in an interesting state. So robots today, as many of you know, can be scripted to perform amazing tasks in known environments. One of my favorite examples is this. This was done in Japan like 15, 20 years ago. This is a picture of a robot balancing a spinning top on the edge of a sword. So that red thing is a spinning top. That long thing, the robot is holding a sword, and the top is being balanced on the narrow edge of a sword. So, you know, if this, was, if this is a solved problem in robotics, and this was done like 15, 20 years ago, you know, what's unsolved? Well, it turns out picking up that cup is an unsolved problem in robotics if you've never seen that cup before. Right? And so it was that latter problem that we'll work on. So, if you've never seen this cup before, how do you pick this up? Well, one thing you can do is use stereo vision to try to build a 3D model of the cup. And uh, on the stair project, we've been fortunate to have had you know, several companies trying to donate hardware to us. And so using a decent commercial stereo vision system, this is an example of the depth map we get, where the different shades of gray indicate different distances, and black is where the algorithm did not find correspondences and therefore did not return distances. 
if you zoom into where the cup is, you know, it's just a mess. You, you, you can barely tell if the handle is on the left or the right. Um, so this is my, I think all of you probably know what Stero is, but this is my cartoon description of what Stero does, right? Which is, um, in Stero Depth Perception, you have two images, one from the left eye and one from the right eye. And stereo depth perception has defined correspondences. So we pick a point in the left eye, right, denoted by the cross. You then have to find the corresponding point in the right eye uh, image, and then you, you know, send out two rays, uh, right, from, from your eyes through these two points, and see where they intersect. And that's triangulation in stereo, and this lets you estimate the distance of a 3D point. And you can also do this for a different point, you know, shown there. And you can estimate distances of, of that point as well. And I think the reason that stereo or dense stereo is hard is um, that if you pick a point like that on the left eye image, it is very difficult to tell which of those points it corresponds to in the right eye image. And depending on which one of those you choose, you can get very different distances. So it's very hard to find out the 3D position of that point there. And what dense stereo does is it tries to take every point in the left eye image and tries to triangulate to every single point in the right eye image, and this is very difficult to get to work. But if stereo doesn't work for us, um, how do you pick this up? Well, we just said that given just a single still image, you can already get a sense of the 3D depth, and you can already get a sense of the 3D space of, this, of, of the scene. So this is what we did using monocular vision, using these monocular vision cues, which is we created a training set comprising five types of objects. And for each of these objects, we labeled it with the, quote, correct place at which to pick up the object. So we label the pencil as saying, pick up a pencil by the midpoint, pick up a wine glass by the stem, pick up a coffee cup by the handle, and so on. And then we trained the learning algorithm to use monocular vision cues so that the algorithm would take us input an image like this, then would try to predict the position of this big red cross. So given a single image, we would use monocular, these monocular vision cues to decide where is the grasp point or the position of the, of the red cross. When the robot faces a novel object, like a novel coffee cup, what it does is then uses the learned classifier to identify the grasp point in the left eye image, identify the grasp point in the right eye image, and you then just take this, these two points and you triangulate them to obtain a single point in 3D, and you then reach on there to grasp it. Okay? And just a contrast this with dense stereo vision, which tries to triangulate every single point in both images, and that's very hard. In contrast, this picks one or sometimes at most a small number of points in both images to triangulate, and that works much better. So then we're going to show you a video of um, this working. This is a video of the stereo robot seeing a variety of objects for the first time using you know, that ball as a cheap webcam we bought from an electronics store. And using even you know, cheap webcam images, the algorithm, the robot often understands the 3D shape of these objects well enough to pick them up. The training set object, the, the training set objects were just those five that you saw earlier. There were, what? There was no cell phone in the training set. Right? There was what? There was the wine glass, the pencil, the book, the chalkboard eraser, and the coffee mug. But training on those five objects, it often generalizes well enough to grasp even fairly different objects. Truth in advertising is to say this works 88% of the time on a large test set of objects. I went to the dollar store to buy objects that we want to try to pick up. I actually have no idea what that is. <laughs> oh. you, you had the coffee, the coffee pot upside down. Did it work when it was right side up? Uh, I'm pretty sure it did, yeah. <laughs> um, and let's see. It turns out you can use exactly the same algorithm on objects placed in a dishwasher. So for these experiments, we moved the camera back. So rather than a wrist-mounted webcam, we actually use a higher quality pair of cameras, pair of, higher quality pair of serial cameras mounted on the base of the robot, um, this would be off the left of the screen. But it's actually the same algorithm to identify grasp points, triangulate, and then reach the arm there to pick up objects. So you use a stereo pair, right? Yes, so this is a stereo pair. Right, oh. uh, uh, no, actually, right, there's a the camera. So, the previous one was a, was a single webcam, but we moved the arms a couple places to take, a few, to take two to four pictures, say. Yeah. And, but, then, but then we used monocular cues in each of these. We used monocular depth perception to figure out where to identify grass points in each image separately, and only after that do we triangulate. Uh, uh, yeah, right. Because from each image, you, because you say take two pictures, in each image you put a 
say where you think the big cross should be, then you triangulate the points where you put the big crosses. Yeah. Oh, when we made this video, there was just the control of the robot arm had a very low update rate, and so we would command the robot in larger steps than we would have liked. This is um, this is a software bandwidth problem. Just how fast we could send commands to the robot. But I was just wondering if it was reestimating the position of the no, yeah, no, constantly each, on each yeah, not 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 in these videos. Uh, one, one shot, of the, one shot, just do the thing, and go for it. Yeah, yeah. This is actually a so um, that actually accounts for most of our grasping failures. It turns out the the with this algorithm anyway, the majority of the grasping failures are, so what the algorithm does, right, is it takes, takes two pictures, then decide, I'm going to reach there. Then you close your eyes and wear heavy gloves, you have no sense of touch, and you reach there and try to, so um, the majority of our grasping failures are if you accidentally knock the object slightly and then you, you know, and, and you don't know you did that. So um, we actually have new hardware with, with um, uh, uh, touch perception in the robot's fingers and that, that makes us work better. But I wasn't going to talk about that today. Are there other questions? Okay. Cool. Uh, so, so, so far I've been showing you um, experiments using one stair platform, a first stair one platform. These are our future or planned stair platforms. Um, stair two uses a larger, more mechanically capable arm. And this one, this was actually built by one of my colleagues, uh, Ken Salisbury and his students. Say more about this later. But um, I'll just show you an example of the same algorithm on a different robot. This is uh, using a Barrett's arm, which is a much larger and more mechanically capable arm, capable of re carrying heavier payloads. But it's the same algorithm that finds grass points. And I guess one modification is you now need to plan the position of the fingers as well. Right? To, to, um, you need to decide where, you know, how to position your fingers as well to pick up different objects. But there was a, a stereo pair of cameras that was a little bit off the right of the screen, takes those images, finds draws points, and then reaches out to pick up these objects. And again, it kind of works. Oh, so that turns out to be a fake rock. We have a lot of fake rocks in my office for some reason. And for those of you there, for those of you that go to the NITS conference, you know why we have ski boots. So, yeah, so the arm actually seems to work. And so that was grasping. The loss of the elements I'll tell you about was, is the spoken dialogue system, which we do using a reinforcement learning algorithm. So those of you that know me a little bit will know that my students and I have been heavily invested in applying reinforcement learning algorithms to control a variety of robots. So, just for fun, here's a, a video of um, autonomous helicopter, of our autonomous helicopter being flown using a reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, so everything here is computer controlled flight where, uh, you know, using one of these learning algorithms, it has learned to control a helicopter. And So a split S is a fast 180 degree turn. Snap row. Style turn is another fast 180 degree turn. Do two loops. The second loop will embellish with a pirouette or a fast spin at the top right there. Another style turn. Done in, done in reverse. Then backwards. Hurricane is where it's... Pardon? Anyone what? Uh, let me ask that later. Not, very, not that I'm aware of. Right. Oh, knife edge is a 90 degree horizontal control fall. Um, stationary, stationary rows turns out to be one of the most difficult maneuvers. Um, right. Stationary flips is another very difficult maneuver. The tick top is like the uh, inverted, you know, grandfather pendulum clock, right? Let's see. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we could do that. Um, yeah, 
So, so, uh, but you know, I want to show this because um, I, I, I guess many of you are fans of machine learning, but it turns out that just in the United States, there may be half a dozen groups that work on autonomous helicopter controllers, perhaps most notably Eric Ferrand's group, which just moved from MIT to Georgia Tech. But um, it turns out these are by far the most difficult, most advanced maneuvers flown on any autonomous helicopter. That's actually a completely non-controversial statement. And it's all done with these reinforcement learning algorithms. And in fact, um, uh, we've actually more or less run out of things to do. There aren't actually other maneuvers they want to do, but they don't know how to do. Mm. Yeah. Is this something that the helicopter is doing that even a human expert would find challenging? Let's see. I'm not talking about myself, obviously, but someone. Yeah, so we are, we're fortunate to have one of the best pilots in the country work with us. Um, not the very best pilot in the country, and um, this did learn from him, but this flies many of the maneuvers even better than he does. I'd just say it's maybe competitive with the very best pilots in the world. I wouldn't say this outperforms the very best pilots in the world, but this does outperform our pilot that, the, that, the, that is one of the top 50 pilots in the United States, maybe? For RC helicopters. Far see how it costs, yeah. It turns out you can't do these things on full-size yeah. helicopters. <laughs> yeah. So... I guess I like some... How does it know it's like I'm not going to fly with some things? You just happen to find that they have to fly barrier or what? I see, yeah, so... Uh, it turns out, you know, helicopters, you're in big, wide, empty space. We just know that... Um, we are not detecting or avoiding obstacles when, when, when right. you're in the air. You're just bring it up there and then it's kind of like going to just um, try to do that sequence of... Um, yeah. yeah. But do you have a model of the ground layer at all? Or? Uh, we know where the ground is, but we just don't have... We just happen to, you know, command the uh, entire maneuver far enough away from the ground. We don't worry about it. Um, it, it turns out that with, with, you know, modern GPS systems, you can get about, well, Ah, no, I, you can get to, uh, yeah, so, uh, so, right, so we have accelerometers and gyros and a compass, magnetometer on board the helicopter. For state estimation, you can use either GPS or cameras. These videos were, were done with cameras on the ground to estimate the position. But you can also use GPS, which gives you about two centimeters error with modern GPS systems. All right. So those fun reinforcement learning and um, following the footsteps of many others, we are uh, Satinta so Singh, Joel Panu, and so on. Um, we you know use these sorts of learning algorithms to develop a uh, spoken dialogue system. But I wasn't. I'm not really going to talk about that. So taking the elements described and putting them together, we have object recognition, mobile manipulation, deaf perception, especially applied to robotic grasping, and the spoken dialogue system. <coughs> When you put these things together, what you can do is build the stair piece fetch the stapler for my office application. So let's see that. I will fetch a stapler for you. So that was the spoken dialogue system kicking out the whole thing. And she actually said Quark's office, one of the other PhD students' office. So the robot uses indoor robot, robot navigation to navigate to the office. It then uses a vision system to detect the door handle, um, drives closer and takes another image, confirms the location of the door handle. Um, so it's figured out you know, which parts of the door handle to push on and so on. And, and again, this is a novel door handle. It's not seen this door or this handle before. Um, goes inside to where it knows is, 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 is the student's desk. Uses foveated vision, that's the panto zoom camera on top, moving around. You can see the camera view on the lower left. Right? So as the camera moves around, you take different images. Finally, it zooms in to confirm where it thinks it's found the stapler. Um, identifies the grass point using that you know, learning algorithm I described earlier. The position of the cross here is, in this camera view, the location of the uh, estimated cross point. It then reaches out to pick up the stapler. It turns out, you know, pick up many different objects. Stapler is this huge black thing. It turns out the only objects you can pick up very reliably. Um, and finally, it switches back to the uh, indoor mobile robot navigation. It's an entirely standard algorithm for navigating indoors to go back to the you know, stapler. And so, there you go. And, you know, on the one hand, this was a, quote, demo. But on the other hand, we've actually done this a few times, fetching, different, fetching, a few, fetching objects from a few different places and so on. And so, um, on the one hand, this is a, quote, demo. But on the other hand, this genuinely integrates all those components I described earlier. And I think this, 
I, I, I hope this is really genuine beginnings of robots that are able to usefully fetch items from around the office. It turns out, once you put all these components together, it becomes relatively easy to rapidly put together these components like navigation, door opening, vision, and so on, to try to put together other applications. So what I want to do is very quickly tell you about a second application that we've been working on, on having a robot take inventory. So here's what I mean. Here's a, build, here's a map of the Stanford Computer Science Building and zooming in to um, those four offices. Actually, I think this one used to be Christina's office. Oh, no, you're on the second floor. Never mind. Um, this was your office? Maybe. <laughs> so what I want to do is a robot um, be able to go inside these four offices and take inventory. So imagine after everyone's gone home, can a robot go inside and figure out where things are and say, figure out where all the coffee mugs are in, this, in, in, in these offices. When we tried to build this application, we found that by far the weakest link was object recognition. So um, this was the result of applying you know, object recognition to detect coffee mugs. And um, we're not the best people in the world at building working object recognition systems. And uh, you know, if, if some of you say that um, you know about vision and you can get it to work better than this, I would have absolutely no argument with that. On the other hand, we were highly motivated to tune a vision system to work as well as we could make it. And this was actually about the best that you know, we as we're not the most experienced vision people, but we were not totally stupid people either, so we're able to do. And for this piece, and, and when you look at uh, robot object recognition, what I want to talk about takes inspiration from, maybe from the natural world, which is that if you look at computer vision, I think most computer vision today is based on RGB color, red, green, blue color, or based on grayscale vision. And in one sense, this makes sense because a lot of video or a lot of images are filmed for humans. And if you go to understand that sort of, you know, that sort of images, then you have to really understand RGB images or grayscale images. But on the other hand, if you look even in perception in the natural world, it extends well beyond the human visible spectrum. So for example, bats and dolphins use sonar to estimate distances directly. And um, if you look at this bird on the right, this is a pretty boring looking bird. It's just a black colored bird. It's not very interesting to look at. But it turns out that if you look at this bird in ultraviolet, then it's actually, and these birds can see in ultraviolet, they appear very colorful to each other. And this is of course rendered in false color so that you and I can see it too. And so um, we've actually done work on using the sort of depth perception for object recognition as well as on you know, sort of hyperspectral or outside the visible spectrum. We're going to talk about only the depth perception piece today. And to describe that, um, let's revisit stereo vision, which we heard a lot about already. But this is another cartoon description of stereo vision, right? So to estimate distances, what stereo does is it picks a point on, say, the mug, and it then you know, extrapolates rays from two cameras and uses triangulation to compute distances. This is an idea called active stereo, which is when you replace one of the cameras with, say, a laser pointer. And what you do is you shine a laser beam onto the object, and so this casts a bright spot on the object. Your camera then sees the position of this red dot, of, of, the, of the green dot, and you can then use triangulation to estimate distances. And this picture is exactly analogous to when you had two cameras and two lines coming out of it. Um, the difference is was when you had two cameras, it was very hard to see whether the two cameras are pointing at the same point. Now, this is called the correspondence problem, now when you have a laser pointer in the camera, it's very easy to be sure that your laser pointer and the camera are looking at the same point because, well, you've just painted that point bright green. So this idea is called active stereo. It's a completely standard idea. It's a very old idea. And um, it turns out, in also completely standard, is you can take this idea even a little bit further, which is instead of casting a single dot into the scene, you can cast a vertical stripe into the scene and scan the stripe horizontally like that. And this gives you a direct 3D measurement, a di direct distance measurement of every single point in the scene. So just to show you what that looks like, this is a um, well, video of our laser scanner in operation. So as the vertical laser is panned horizontally across the scene, it is uh, measuring the 3D distance of every point that the laser falls into. Okay. And with that, these are examples of the sort of data you get. On the left is your normal visible image, and on the right is a 3D point cloud 
you know, of the same scene. And so on the right is the 3D point cloud that's been rendered you know, at a slightly higher point of view, right? So you take the camera and move it up. And on the one hand, this looks like a lot of data because you have a distance for every point. On the other hand, there's actually also maybe less information here than might appear to the human visual system, just because our human visual system is so good at interpreting these scenes. And so, for example, we, do not, we still do not see the rear halves of these coffee mugs, right? Which is occluded. And what these depth measurements this is one way I think about it. So given a 3D point cloud, you can do things like compute surface normals. And so in that image, the different colors indicate different, uh, different you know, orientation of the surfaces. So purple are horizontal surfaces. The cyan and green are uh, vertical surfaces at, at a range of vertical orientations. And the way I like to think about this is you can now represent a pixel using this 9D vector, where for every pixel you know is RGB color. You know it's x, y, z position, and you also know, you know n1, n2, n3, a 3D surface normal vector. And these nine components are not independent, so in argue is it nine or is it actually lower dimensional? But let's think of this as if you use only a camera, then it's as if you only get to observe the first three components of this vector. With these other sensors, you get to observe the full vector. And that lets you directly measure things like object shape, object shape features, object size, you can ask questions like, is it sitting on a horizontal surface? Because it turns out most coffee mugs are found on horizontal surfaces like desks. You can ask what is highly object above ground and so on. And when you apply this to object recognition, this is actually a fairly typical result where with the 3D information as well, it completely cleans up the results and you get you know, near perfect object recognition. You evaluate the algorithm more quantitatively. Um, F score goes up from, in, in this evaluation, coffee miles goes up from 67 to 94% F score. And uh, speaking slightly loosely, this is F score, not error. Is, but but you know, look at, if you think of 1 minus F score as error, informally you can think of this as an 83% error reduction. And um, for us anyway, in our experience, this was actually the gap between a vision system that was not usable for our application and a vision system that is usable for application. Class as well, or is, or is this just particular like this? Oh, no, one? This, is a, this is object class recognition, training and testing on different coffee mugs. So, this is some, um, so put this into our application, and uh, um, so this is stare using that, you know, opening novel door algorithm, indoor navigation, and so on. To go inside these offices, to use the laser scanner to scan the offices. So, there you see it going from desk to desk, and you see that vertical green laser being used, and, and so you know, the robot is building a 3D model, at least getting these 3D point clouds of um, all the desks in the office. So it's done with the first office, um, go next door to the second office in a row. Again, uh, no, more than that, this may be 10x, I think. Uh, wait, so, sorry. Wait, nobody sneaks in and moves any coffee mugs. Uh, yeah, not while the robot is moving, yeah. Um, so let's see, in these experiments, I think it took about eight seconds to scan a desk, so hopefully you aren't moving the coffee mugs during those eight seconds. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah. Let's see, and so results. If you use only visible light, if you use only you know, color vision or RGB vision, Using our classifier, that the best classifier that we're able to tune is all of these are the results you get, where every red dot and every black dot is either a false positive or a false negative. With the 3D information, these were the results we got. So there were there were seven coffee mugs in those four offices left there by the you know, left there in the natural places by the denizens of, of, of the offices. We added an additional 22 coffee mugs, making it a total of 29 coffee mugs. And on, uh, these are actually the results of the first experiment we ran. And the robot actually found 29 for 29 coffee mugs. Um, we've since then, we've repeated this experiment a, f a few more times. And it's a fairly typical result for the robot to make somewhere between zero to two mistakes on, on, on the scope of problem. And um, there, in fact, are also all the automatically extracted pictures of all the coffee mugs. And so again, I think, you know, on the one hand, this was a quote demo, but on the other hand, I think this really is maybe the genuine beginnings of robots that are able to go around and take inventory and, and usefully take inventory. So 
Um, this is one last thing I want to tell you about. So, you know, earlier I showed pictures of uh, the Stair 2 and the future planned Stair platforms. And this is you know, designed and built for us by, by, by my friend Ken Salisbury. And the last thing I want to do is tell you a little bit about the uh, personal robotics program, which is something slightly different. So whereas we've been talking about work at Stanford, this is maybe more about work at other universities even. So, I think the PC revolution in the 1970s was enabled by their having a standardized computing platform for everyone to develop on. This is the Apple II PC. And um, the fact that it was a standardized computing platform, that made it possible for someone to buy you know, what was a very expensive computer at the time, but it made it possible for someone to, quote, invent the spreadsheet and for everyone else in the world to then use the same spreadsheeting software. That made it possible for someone to, quote, invent a word processor and then for everyone else in the world to use the same word processing software. Right? And obviously Windows is a huge role in this too. And I think robotics today lacks such a platform. And this means two things. One, it means there are very high startup costs in robotics because uh, if you go around the country, you see that you know, all these research groups spend all this time building up their own robotic platforms. This is high startup costs. And furthermore, um, because every group, if you go around the country, you also find that with relatively few exceptions, almost every research group will have a completely unique robotic platform. Um, both in hardware and software. And that also makes it difficult for research groups to share ideas or share inventions with each other because your code won't run on my robot, my code won't run on yours. So um, together with colleagues in a company called Willow Garage, we're working on building say, about 10 copies of this robot, um, which we hope to make available to universities and research labs for free in some way, under some terms. And so, what you see here is a video of this robot being teleoperated. There's actually no AI here. All this is human intelligence, um, human you know, using joysticks essentially to control the robot. And you can sort of tell that this robot is um, mechanically capable of doing many of the household assistant tasks we like it to. Actually, let's let you watch the video. I'll buy it, I'll buy it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't remember. This is the only segment that sped up. All the others were not. I'm going to ask about the beer a lot. Right. So, you can still tell that Robotics today, clearly we should keep on working on hardware platforms, and improving the hardware and so on. But also that, um, I think this video also shows that robotic platforms today are maybe, quote, good enough to already carry out many of the household tasks we like robots to. And if only we can get the right software into it to make robots do these things autonomously. So, um, you know, we hope that these robots will roll off the assembly line within six months. So if, if John wants to buy one, you should let me know. <laughs> Um, let's see. So uh, we're hoping to make these for free in some way to some number of university and research labs. Um, and the company Willow Garage probably sell these for a price comparable to a luxury car, which is sort of a non-answer because luxury cars are in job of space. But and, 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 and tell you more in private afterwards. So come to the air conditioning. Yeah. So um, just to wrap up, start off saying we want to develop a robot platform integrating tools from all of these different areas of AI. And what you heard in this talk was a number of tools that we put together to develop the stair piece fetch stapler from my office application, as well as the inventory application. And then you also heard about the uh, personal robots platform. And I just want to say out loud the names of the lead PhD students that, that made all this work possible. Um, Ellen Klingbell was the woman in the video. Steve Goulds, Ashtar Saxena led most of the depth perception and the uh, grasping work. And I think he's actually giving a talk in live labs in two weeks with, with, with all the details on that that I did not talk about. Um, Peter Abiu led most of the helicopter work, and, took, and Adam Coles was also involved. Uh, Morgan Quigley's probably sweat more blood than anyone else on getting things to work on the stair project, and Eric Burgo was also involved in all this. So, 
Thank you very much. Do we have any more questions for Andrew? Oh. So, I think the thing you talked about the least is the dialogue system. Yeah. Is it based on industry fossil learning too? Uh, no, it wasn't. I, actually, so we did a bunch of things with Spurn Dialogue System. The, the one published piece was the following, which is, um, um, you know, when you go up to a robot, uh, and um, we, we, we have a component that uses uh, a speaker ID detection to try to figure out who you are. And so the robot has this, has this other mode where um, uh, it, it doesn't know who you are, or try to make chit chat with you to try to elicit more words from you so that it can hopefully recognize who you are. And then when it finally recognizes, thinks it recognizes you, it's gonna you know, to take the gamble and say hi so and so and, and hopefully you got your name right. It turns out there are actually studies that show that if a robot greets you by name, it it, it you know it emotionally generates something in you. Um, so so it was that. It wasn't really none, none of this really illustrates in the in the integrated demo. John? Did you learn what, what was the most important lesson you learned by integrating all the pieces together other than just doing them all separately? So so I think two things. Uh, one is that I think um, one of, to me, a lot of the most interesting research, you know, for, for, for me has arisen at the, uh, what were traditionally um, bound, traditionally disparate fields in AI where with traditional boundaries. So for example, the foveated vision piece, where right? you use a panto zoom camera. Um, if you work only in vision, I don't know if you end up doing that. But once you think about vision on the physical robot, we can move things around. It's just so natural to do. And it, so that, that was one example. And combining vision and grasping and so on. Um, so, so this idea of, well, as we work on this project, we often just stumble on interesting problems. You know, they're at the boundaries of traditional research areas. And the other is, um, there's actually this fascinating intellectual problem that we think a lot about, which is integrated representations. So when we have all of these different components, one that's trying to figure out grasping, one that's trying to recognize objects, one that's trying to navigate without colliding into things, is there a, you know, um, uh, what's the word, common lingua? Is there, is there a common language for all of these very different algorithms to talk to, uh, to, to, to interact uh, with each other um, so that they're all maybe representing their own knowledge, representing the things they figure out about the world in a sort of common unified representation? So that latter problem is something we're actually working a lot on. Uh, uh, is, is there a common representation, a common language for these sorts of algorithms to to, to, to manipulate or to interact with. Oh, also, oh okay, good. Yeah. So the activators are, I mean, they're pretty impressive, but they're pretty far from human range of ability as far as grasping and yeah. manipulating. Is there, I mean, is it just a question of cost at this point, or is still a lot of room for improving them? So, let's see. Yeah, so there's ample room for improvement. There are, um, boy, yeah, you know, human manipulation is amazing. But then um, uh, it turns out that for many tasks, you do not need, so let's see, tying your shoelaces is really difficult and folding cloth is really difficult. But on the other hand, if you want to put a row on every home, maybe you don't need to tie shoelaces and maybe you don't need to fold cloth. So, um, and one of my favorite examples is when people see this work, they often ask about Rosie the robot from the Jetsons cartoon, which is a smart <laughs> robot. And um, it turns out I think, you know, to put a Rosie robot is a robot that would very wisecrack and do the things and play the kids and you know whatever. But it turns out, and and I don't think we'll get there in the next few years. But on the other hand, it turns out that if your goal is to put a useful robot in every home, you know, wise cracking of the kids is not needed. And so I think I actually think that um, um, part of goal in the project we tell ourselves like to develop the technology to put a robot in every home in, within a decade. And I think that's feasible. Yeah. John. So the cost of the pen tool camera, why not just have, you know, do stitching a whole bunch of, of high-res cameras together and strategically do it? Is it really cheaper to have a thing that kind of is physically moving around and just doing the stitching, doing as usual? I see. Yeah, I don't know. It may make sense to just use, um, um, oh, let's see. So I believe there are 100, um, 100 megapixel CCD images, um, and I believe a pencil zoom camera uh, corresponds to a one gigapixel camera, which well, you cannot there buy. Are gigapixel oh, there are. Okay, oh, I yeah. didn't know that. Oh, huh, cool. Yeah. So, so you can do that. Um, there's actually one other thing, which is a computational requirement. So, if you have a gigapixel image, you can't actually run the sliding window classifier over the entire image, and so you may end up. Um, we've actually done. You, you probably. 
Well, we have actually done some little things with a high-res camera and, and uh, not a gigapixel, somewhere in between the two. And even there, you know, you, it's very hard to take such a huge image and download it from your camera to your computer because FireWire and USB are not that fast. And even if you could suck down the images that fast, it's still very expensive to run your classifier everywhere on the image. And so um, uh, even if you do that, we've actually, just one experiment, we've actually used the same foveated idea to look at the low res version, then pick out the promising regions, and then only digitally or physically zoom into those regions. If only to, to increase the switching speed, because I mean, with the pen tilt, yeah. you know, one of the restrictions is that there's a physical motion yeah. that needs to happen. Together. So you can yeah. just have a bunch of cheap cameras which you can multiplex. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That totally makes sense too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, what's cool. the yeah. again? Again. Thanks very much.